If you have your Bible, go ahead and open up to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 is where we are headed this morning. We'll be picking up in verse 36 in just a moment. And as you're turning there, you see in front of you once more uh, this table in the wilderness image that we've been exploring throughout this year. Um, Throughout the year, we've spent several weeks considering this call that we have as God's people out into the wilderness, the call to live a different kind of life, not marked by power and popularity or sensation and spectacle, but by quiet humility and selfless sacrifice. This is the wilderness way that God calls us to, as his people, and that Jesus showed us through his life and ultimately through his death on the cross. But this wilderness way is not a dead end. Just like the cross leads to resurrection, this wilderness life leads to the abundant table of God. So last week, we began specifically considering what this wilderness table is a place for. What is this table for? Or who is it for, right? We looked at Jesus in this Samaritan woman at the well. And we saw how a simple conversation about a cup of water can become an occasion to experience the deep flowing living water of Jesus. She came to that well lonely and unknown, but she left that place filled with joy and fully known, proclaiming, come see this one who told me everything I've ever done. I'm known by him and loved by him. This table in the wilderness is a place to come and be known. And so this morning, we're reading from Acts chapter 2, where we will see another picture of what this wilderness table is for. Acts chapter 2 begins with the story of the incredible out pouring of the Holy Spirit. The disciples are gathered together, and then suddenly, wind blew, tongues of fire appeared, people began speaking in different languages so that everyone could understand what was being said, and it raised quite a bit of attention. So Peter, of course, the first one to speak always, gets up and begins speaking. He addresses the crowd that has gathered, and he preaches a powerful sermon about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit uh, that had been told by the prophet Joel, and he goes on to talk about the death and resurrection of Jesus. And then his sermon concludes in verse 36, where we will begin reading and then see what all happens next. So let's read Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 36. Peter concludes his sermon. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. And when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied, Repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he warned them and pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. 
they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. Amen. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we thank you for the gift of your word and for the invitation that you give to come to your table to be known and to be your people. God, I pray as we consider the words of your scripture together this morning that you would sharpen our minds and soften our hearts that we might know you and love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So for a moment, I'd like to invite you to go on a journey back to your elementary school. Can you imagine that place? Uh, What it was like? uh, What the the building looked like? The rooms that you walked through, that you encountered? I I can remember the entrance of my elementary school. Going in and seeing the front desk there where the receptionist was always very kind and welcoming to greet everyone who came. I can remember the hallways going through the school, each one belonging to a different grade level. There's the the library, where the librarian would read stories to us as we sat down, or where we would have book fairs, all right? That's where I got my my first, and well, the set that I still have of the Chronicles of Narnia, right? I mean, just this entrance into this wonderful world of literature and reading and fantasy. So great. And then there's the cafeteria, right? Uh, Where you gather and you eat lunch, where one time I remember spilling a can of soda all over myself, and it looked like something else had happened. Um, And uh, I was very embarrassed. And then, of course, there's the playground. You can't leave out the playground, right? I loved the swing set, you know, just getting on there, kicking my legs, closing my eyes. It was like flying. It was wonderful. Do you remember your elementary school? Which places stand out to you? What memories begin to to come to mind? Here's another memory that I have of my elementary school. One time, a few years after elementary school, I went back to visit, uh, to wonder and see, you know, the teachers that were still around who I had had and so on. And I remember going back in through that entrance, coming to the front desk where the friendly receptionist was, but something was different. Something was very different. You see, when I was first a student at this elementary school, I had to stand on my tiptoes to just see over the front desk. And going back to visit years later, it barely came up to my waist. The towering bookshelves in the library were actually quite small. Uh, The lunch tables in the cafeteria were tiny. I can't imagine being able to fit at it. Everything. The whole school was smaller somehow. It was like the whole place had changed. But of course, it had not changed. I had grown, right? I was taller and and bigger. Uh, It had not shrunk. I had grown. In our text today... We see that this wilderness table, the table of God, is a place to grow. 
It's a place where we are meant to grow, to become bigger. It's a place to grow. We're invited to this table as a place to be known, but we continue at the table and we grow as a people of God together. So let's look back at this passage and touch on a few parts of it. We began reading at the conclusion of Peter's sermon in verse 36, where he proclaims, God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. This is the foundation of Christian faith. It's what we celebrated three weeks ago on Easter Sunday. Jesus was crucified, but God has raised him up. He is Lord. He is Messiah. Now, to say such things are powerful, but also very subversive, right? The the word Messiah means anointed one, and it refers to the person who would be anointed as king over God's people to rule and reign. But just a couple of verses earlier uh, in in, uh, Acts 2, where Peter is preaching, he declares that Jesus does not merely sit on David's throne in Jerusalem as king over Israel. Rather, Jesus sits at God's throne in heaven as king over the whole world, right? That's powerful. That's powerful. But Jesus is not only Messiah, king, ruler over all, he's also called Lord here. And that language is very subversive for its time, right? This title, Lord, was commonly used in Rome to describe Caesar, the ruler of the most powerful empire on earth at the time. Caesar is Lord was a common patriotic chant in Rome. But here, Peter declares that Jesus is Lord, not Caesar. Jesus is Lord. That is to say, Jesus is more powerful than the most powerful person on earth. That's the kind of power that Jesus has. He alone rules over all. He alone should have our allegiance. All the other things that have ruled your life, all the other things that have captured your affections, all the other things that have directed your loyalty must be renounced. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Messiah. This is the message that Peter proclaims. This is the foundation of our faith. And then, verse 37 says, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. Now, it doesn't say exactly why they were cut to the heart. Perhaps they feel guilty and remorseful for the part they played in the crucifixion of Jesus. They feel the weight of their sin, and they want to be free from it. Perhaps they feel the thrilling ache of hope that the news, this good news of the long-awaited Messiah, has finally come to pass. And they're finally seeing that it's so much bigger than just the restoration of Israel. It's actually about the restoration of the whole world. And so they feel wonder and awe at this news and want to do something about it. Whatever the case, they were cut to the heart. Peter's words penetrated deeply. And they longed to respond, so they asked, what shall we do? What shall we do about this guilt that weighs so heavily? What shall we do about this good news that's finally come true? What shall we do? 
And Peter replies in verse 38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, these words in verse 38 should begin stirring up some of the things that we've been talking about this year. Do you remember the voice in the wilderness preparing the way for the Lord? Do you remember John the Baptist's words, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near? Do you remember when Jesus came to him to be baptized and the voice of God spoke, this is my beloved son, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove? This is precisely what Peter's describing in verse 38. They ask, what shall we do? And Peter's response is, will follow Jesus into the wilderness of repentance where John the Baptist called him. Follow Jesus into the waters of baptism. Follow Jesus because his death and resurrection have provided forgiveness of sins. Follow Jesus and receive the Holy Spirit. You see, this proclamation of Jesus as Lord does not just call for praying a prayer or being baptized. It doesn't just call for affirming some beliefs or joining a church. It calls for a lifetime of following Jesus. Following Jesus into the wilderness and being seated with Jesus at the table of God. That's what this call is all about. Now, I want to say something about baptism. We've talked about it previously when we were looking at John the Baptist, but I want to say something else here. There are many who approach baptism like a graduation ceremony. Baptism means you've graduated and you get your degree for eternal life. But that view actually gets things backwards. Baptism is not graduating from school. It's enrolling in school, right? It's not the end. It's just the start. Eternal life is not a degree we get and then hang up on a wall somewhere, set somewhere to collect dust until we die. Eternal life begins right now as we follow Jesus, as we become his disciples, as we become his students. All who believe that Jesus is Lord and want to follow him are invited to enroll in the school of the kingdom of God through baptism. Baptism is not the end goal. It's just the beginning of following and learning from Jesus, entering into the school of the kingdom of God. And that's exactly what we see as we continue reading this passage, as we look to the life of the early church. After they're baptized, we don't see them all go home happy to have received their eternal life degree. No. We see them enter into a life of following and learning from Jesus. Just like new students at school. Verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. So right here we have a picture of the table of God in the wilderness as a place to grow. A place to grow in Christ. Uh, it's, it's like this picture of our elementary schools where we all grew up. The apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. Right here in the early church, we have the kingdom of God, we have the classroom, we have the playground, 
We have the cafeteria. We even have a front desk, right? Follow me here. Let's look at each one of these. First, you've got the classroom, right? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Part of following Jesus involves being taught. It involves learning the story of God throughout all of Scripture. The early church devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Now, what are the apostles' teachings? Well, in short, the teachings um, are all of the teachings that we find in the stories and letters from the apostles throughout the New Testament, the stories of the Gospels and Acts, the letters from Paul and Peter and James and John and so on. The, the essence of the apostles' teachings is, is in this, but that's a lot to hold on to. And so I, I love uh, reminding and, and, and remembering this ancient summary of the apostles' teachings called the Apostles' Creed. It dates all the way back to the late second century and has served the church since then as a faithful summary of what the apostles taught and what we read in Scripture. Uh, on Easter Sunday, three weeks ago, we read the words of the Apostles' Creed together as we came to the table of communion. Some of you might remember two years ago, we spent about three months walking through some of the teachings of the Apostles' Creed, learning these basics of Christian faith. This ancient summary begins... I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Then it goes on to say, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. And it narrates his birth and death and burial and resurrection and ascension and his coming return. And finally, it says, I believe in the Holy Spirit the holy Catholic Church, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. This is a faithful summary of what the apostles taught. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the people of God living the life of God. That's the apostles' teaching. Now, I, I recently had a conversation with someone who expressed to me some concerns about our reading of the Apostles' Creed. They were concerned about the word Catholic in this uh, ancient confession that's used to describe the church, worried that it might send people away to go attend a Roman Catholic church. Uh, but maybe that was confusing or, or, or something to you as well. And I'll simply remind us that this lowercase c, Catholic, that appears in that ancient creed does not refer to the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, it is much older than the Roman Catholic Church. It didn't exist at the time that this creed was first put together. This word, Catholic, is the Greek word for the whole. We believe in the holy, whole, universal church, the church of all times and all places. And so we can and do affirm the holy Catholic church. We affirm that the church is much bigger than just this congregation, and we affirm that it, it's, it's much larger than this point in time. The church exists throughout history and across the world, right? That's what that phrase means. And so, you know, with that concern, if after reading that together a few weeks ago, any of you felt compelled to go confess your sins to the Pope, come talk to me and we'll sort that out. Um, but I, I'm not too worried about that. So all of this to say, the early church devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They learned the story of God who created all things. The story of Jesus who lived and died and rose again and will come back. 
The story of the Holy Spirit who lives within and among his people even now today, guiding and transforming us as we follow Jesus. Part of following Jesus is learning and studying the scriptures. I love what Ty said last week as we were in our dwelling passage, mentioning how he, as a child, memorized the the words uh, of the Beatitudes, these blessings that we've been dwelling in. Uh, Our culture today has lost the art of memorization. Uh, Not just memorizing Bible verses. We don't memorize anything anymore. I don't know anyone's phone number anymore. I I don't even really know Caitlin's. I have to think really hard, and I can kind of remember it. Um, But we just don't remember things anymore, right? Because we got it on our phone. We got it on Google. But it would be a wonderful thing to actually store these words of life in our minds and hearts, to not just export them to our phones. There is something good in memorizing the words of God. So I encourage you, consider that uh, as a spiritual discipline, uh, to, to meditate on and memorize some of these key words and phrases in Scripture. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. This is the classroom of Jesus. But school was never just the classroom, right? There's also recess, right? On the all-important playground. That's also part of school. And we see that with the early church. They did not only devote themselves to the apostles' teaching, but also to fellowship, to fellowship, right? As God's people, we need to learn not only to to learn together, but also to play together, right? We need to go out on the playground sometimes as the people of God. Play is actually a vital part of our learning and of our growing There's a training organization in the UK that's done some study on the importance of play. Listen to this. It's from an article that was written. It says, play deprivation occurs when a child is unable to play freely or engage in normal play activities. It can inhibit social and emotional learning and damage early child development. A play-deprived child may find it harder to interact with others throughout their lifetime, leading to poor resilience in certain situations and reduced self-control. Studies of play deprivation in children have found that it can be a serious problem for children, their families, and others as they grow older. Lack of play leads to lack of growth. If we cannot play, we will not grow. We need to be able to play together. The table of God, if this is going to be a place to grow, then it needs to be a place to play. It needs to be a place where we can be devoted to fellowship with one another. I was recently talking with, with Bill a, a, a while ago, and, and we were talking about how as God's children, we should be some of the most joyful people on the planet. We should be some of the most playful people that are ever encountered. Unfortunately, as Richard Foster says, it's an occupational hazard for religious people to become stuffy bores. This is not what the early church was like. The early church was a people devoted to fellowship. They were a playful people. They went from the classroom to the playground, and they did it together. They grew in Christ. What might that look like for us? To be a place of joy and laughter and playfulness. Next up on our list, we have the cafeteria, right? 
They devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. And this, uh, you know, depending on scholars and interpretations, could specifically refer to the the table of communion, uh, remembering Christ and his body and blood. Uh, And it might also refer to simply sharing meals together. And I don't think it has to be either or. I think it can be both. As a people of God, we're called to the table together. Every week we come to the table of communion uh, and we're reminded that we need God. We are hungry and thirsty for righteousness, as we've read, and we will be filled by the God who feeds us. As we come to the table, we recognize our need and we receive from our generous Father in heaven. But not just the the communion table, every table we share is an opportunity to encounter God with another person. Every meal we share is an opportunity for fellowship, playfulness, community, depth. We've spent a lot of time talking about some of these things, and I just want to remind you and encourage you, go out to eat with someone. Invite someone over for dinner. The kingdom of God is in those moments. It is good. You don't go through a school day without going to the cafeteria. The same is true for the people of God as we go through the school of his kingdom. We learn, we play, and we eat together. And then finally, this is where metaphors start to break down, but just hang on with me. The front desk, right? Uh, Maybe that is a picture, an image of of what it is to be a people of prayer. Uh, What I mean by that is that front desk, at least for me, as I came and went from school, was always a place of welcome. It was always a place to be received with joy. And that's what prayer is for us. It's always a place of welcome. It's it's a place to be received with joy. God delights as we come to him in prayer. He longs to see us and, and, and receive us as we come. It's a place where we are greeted. Another thing about that front desk is that it's where I entered the school building, and it's also where I left the school building. And prayer is the place where we come to God, and it's the place where we are sent by God. Prayer is the whole thing, right? Prayer is the whole thing. Our entire lives are lives of prayer. This is a picture of the early church. It was this growing, learning community that learned together, played together, ate together, and entered and went together in prayer. And this all takes shape as the passage continues through their daily lives together. Sharing with each other. Gathering in the temple to worship, but also in their homes day by day. Sharing their lives with one another, right? Because the table is a place to be known. And so they knew each other. They shared life with each other and they journeyed together as they grew in Christ. And all of this builds to the final verse. In verse 47, the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. I want to say two things about this. One of them is we grow in depth in God. But part of growth involves building relationships with others. Right? The Lord added to their number those who were being saved. And so we talked about this more last week. That woman at the well left and went and told everyone in her town, come and see this one who has told me everything I ever did. Part of growing is entering into life with other people. Part of growing is not just me and my depth, but us and reaching out. 
And so who might we reach out to? Who might we enter into relationship with? This world is a lonely world. We need to reach out to one another. We need to, to relearn the art of friendship. That's part of what it is to grow as God's people. But there's something else in this verse, and it's just the last two words. Those who were being saved. Salvation is not just a one-time moment, right? It's not just something that happened and hooray, we're, we're done with that. Now we get to wait until the end comes right? It's not just a degree that we get and cash in on death. Salvation is an ongoing journey. Those who were being saved, we are a people who are being saved. It's still happening, and may it continue to happen as we continue journeying with God and growing in him. And so as we close here, I just want to read one verse from 2 Peter as a blessing. He writes to the people, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The table is a place to grow. It's a place where we grow in grace. We grow in knowledge as we continue to follow Jesus, our Lord and Savior. May it be so. Amen.